Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Good Time. This film came out in 2017. It was directed by Josh and Vinny Septi. This film was a follow-up to their film Heaven Knows What I Believe, which is a film that always stuck with me over the years. I saw it initially when it uh, was released and I just thought it captured a very authentic world, you know, of the homeless in New York, the heroine scene, by making it very stripped down, very raw, through the casting of the actual homeless, but also mixing it with a sort of elevated aesthetic. Heaven Knows What certainly has cinematic qualities to it, I would say, but Good Time really expands on all of that, and, and of course casting more famous actors at the center, of course, with Robert Pattinson in the lead role, but also just kind of plunging us more into a cinematic world here, where they're really developing their aesthetic more to excellent results. When you think of the Safdies, or at least when I do, it's like you initially have a, a physical reaction to it, uh, which is good, that's what you want. You know, they certainly have a style and it sticks with you. It like, you know, it's, it's just so gritty and unrelenting and uh, just adrenaline infused. They like to put you right in the action of things, into the lives of very desperate people who often make very, very stupid decisions before they meet their inevitable doom because of their actions. And always we have the seedy underbelly of the New York City streets as our, our backdrop. The cinematography for me is one of the key reasons why this movie works so well because it's, and just overall in terms of the style, it's going for a very cinema verite thing, but also it has a kind of an art house aesthetic as well. In the sense that yes, it has a very grainy sort of almost improvisational quality to it, yet it is always very conscious of its cinematic style constantly incorporating kind of the neon lights of the city and having them kind of you know reflected onto the faces of the people or in the background compositionally but even in in some of the houses it's like you've got that neon look going on constantly throughout and it does feel very deliberate so it's as if it's got its feet in two worlds yes the cinema verite almost italian neorealism with the casting of people who who live you know, these real lives. And that creates the authenticity, but then the kind of art house style, the more deliberate, deliberate style that they're going for artistically kind of heightens everything. Which makes sense because the film does feel like this grand odyssey that just happens to take place in a, a 24 hour period. And it's as if we're kind of piggybacking on the shoulders of, of Connie, Robert Pattinson's character. And a lot of the moments within the movie can be very strange. They can be very kind of episodic, but then they go quickly into a, an adrenaline rush. And so a lot of times when that happens in real life, you do feel like you're in the midst of being in a movie. And then you add to it kind of a very, a new agey, very synth based type of, of musical score. And then it, it comes out, you have a very compelling film that is reminiscent of films that came out probably in the late seventies into the eighties, but with its own sense of movement that does feel very fresh. These guys rely on close-ups in order to create that that emotional potency and normally I, I don't like that. I'm normally not a fan of close-ups when they're used too often because it feels too easy. It's like they're handing you the, the emotion and the viscera and I, I normally think that things like that need to be earned. Uh, but these guys, I have to say ironically, really carry it off and I can't imagine them doing it any other way. It works because the key here to the movie is the immersion. So you're not exposed to the full picture. And so the fact that you don't have that perspective in a way makes you feel a lot less in control with these close-ups. It wants to be in the moment. So it's focusing really tightly in on the faces and the immediacy of the moment, the knee-jerk emotion, if you will, rather than the spatial coherence. So you really don't have an idea of where these characters are in relation to the space around them a lot of the time. So you really don't have a sense of where the characters are in relation to the space around them quite often throughout the movie and it's as if you're feeling things out with them and that's a key part I think of what makes it very cinematic and more of an experience and yet it's not all shaky cam it doesn't feel like com just completely impulsive there is an intelligence and an integrity behind every shot and even as the film goes on a lot of the set pieces have a very artful sort of quality to them an intentional quality. And as the film goes on, many of the set pieces do have that very artful sort of quality that I mentioned, and a very intentional quality where it's purposely trying to reflect the themes. The romance apocalypse scene in the third act of the film is a prime example of that. A very cinematic set piece for the film, yet it's still rooted, as I say, in that gritty realism. But, you know, when you watch something like that, your gut reaction to see a sequence like that in a movie like this does feel kind of counterintuitive, but it actually works really well and it doesn't feel that gimmicky. It more serves the drama in a really nice way. It felt a lot like the Pierre Le Fou episode in, in Cowboy Bebop, which is 
an amazing episode aesthetically, but also just one of the coolest ones, in my opinion. The casting of Robert Pattinson was also a very good decision because, yes, he does, he just, you can't deny, he, he's a star. He looks like a, a star. He has a quality to him that is just very engaging in the face. Kind of a tired sort of melancholia, um, but there's also the ability to really pierce through with those, those blue eyes, which is really important for the character. He can create a sort of manic intensity and, and an immediacy because his eyes are so expressive. And for me, this is this is the best role I've ever seen him in, though I won't pretend to be some like Robert Pattinson connoisseur or anything like that. But I just think he really carried the weight of the emotion and the stress, the adrenaline really, really well throughout. Though he is playing a really terrible person who has almost no redeeming qualities, you, you really do want to follow him and you're compelled by him. And yeah, he does a lot of terrible things to a lot of people around him in order to get what he wants. And always, almost always, for selfish reasons, most of the characters he comes into contact with in the movie are, are hurt in some way, catching some short, sort of shrapnel. But I think the reason why we're so compelled by him is because of these external characters that enter this odyssey, because there is a humanity and a personality to them, which makes the consequences, of course, all the more potent. Each character in this movie feels very, very real, like they've really lived their life, and, and the spaces themselves just feel very, very lived in. They don't feel like sets. And if there's one thing that I think the Safdie brothers are absolutely amazing at, it is is world building, the details in every inch of the frame. And I feel like they only expand on that in a movie like Uncut Gems, which came out um, recently. Robert Pattinson's brother in the film, Nick, who's actually played by Benny Sefti, interestingly, is I think an essential character to the film in terms of creating a lot of the pathos as well. Even though he is not present in the real meaty sections of the film, really is not there in the, the, the second act, he bookends the film at the beginning and the end in a way to kind of create that emotional binding and that motivation for the film. The opening scene where Nick is talking to his, his therapist, his psychiatrist, whatever, is it's so revealing in many ways and yet it the, the scene doesn't reveal anything to us. And that's another thing that I think the Safdies are, are really good at. Being able to build a character without a lot of information about them being revealed. But it's all just in their decisions, whether it's the smallest gesture or just the way they re they phrase a response to a question. A lot of that just speaks volumes, especially in this scene. And here we have that. We have a character we can we can tell very clearly is is very misunderstood very much in pain, very lost, and in a bad situation that is only becoming worse because of his his brother Connie. While the whole story is about Connie trying to bail his brother out of jail, the irony is, is that he is the most selfish character in the entire film, always wanting a sense of control and demanding it in any ways necessary, which makes you wonder what their relationship really is like because we don't get to see it much. It seems to me a very abusive one, a means of exercising so much control for Connie. But I love the ending and I love the way that it mirrors the beginning, but with this new sense of progression in the character of Nick. Um, in the beginning, of course, he's very closed off and scared and hurt, lacking his identity. And yet in the end, he's learning to try to find that comfort within himself, finding the ability to trust again and willing to change for the better. When the movie's over, it feels almost like you've been hit by a car. There's just kind of like this ringing shell shock quality to, to, to how you feel because of the intensity of it. Yet at the same time, you leave with a, a sense of hope, hoping that the character of Nick will begin to reform his identity on his own. I really like this movie a lot. I do think it's a huge improvement on heaven knows what in terms of really establishing that that cinematic style. When I compare it to Uncut Gems, it's actually kind of interesting because there are things about Uncut Gems that I think are much better. I do think that it's more well built structurally and I think it's more defined in terms of the character development and such. However, with Good Time, I, to me, it felt more emotionally resonant. I was more engaged in it. And I just find myself more taken with, with the story of it on a, on a personal level. So when I think about the two, my head says that Uncut Gems is the better film. The critic in me says that, but my heart kind of goes more with uh, Good Time. I actually think if you haven't seen a Safdie Brothers film, this would be the perfect one to delve into. Yes, it is going to feel like someone just splashed ice cold water uh, on your face, but it's an experience for sure. It submerges you into a world whether you want to be along for the ride or not. It's like you can't help yourself. You're just pulled in. Like a panic attack, it, it wears you out, yet it draws you forward and it repels you at times. And that's, that's why we go to the movies. To have that experience of a lot of different complex emotions, I think. Um, so 
yeah, there's a lot to like here. And I think there's just a lot to like about the Safdies. I love their enthusiasm as artists and, and their intelligence is obvious, as is their love for filmmaking. I love their enthusiasm just as people and as artists. Their intelligence is obvious, as is their love for filmmaking. It's evident in the way they craft every little aspect of the film, even though it seems very immediate, a lot of planning and detail went into it. So I really look forward to seeing what they can come up with next. I do think in terms of American film, they are some of our more intriguing filmmakers. And that is my review. Thank you all for listening. All my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.